it is uh, a, a a steep learning curve each time I was here. I think uh, I both uh, uh, attempt to understand, and I'm sure I misunderstand uh, much of what you say. But I think the great capacity of being a scientist or an artist is the is the sense of openness to uh, trying to understand. So um, uh, for many years, I've been interested in the links between art and science, uh, knowledge and exploration. And I, I'm based in South Africa, so I come from South Africa, yet I've traveled extensively in the Pacific in many of the regions where um, James Cook, the explorer, has been, and he appears a number of times in this presentation. Last year in Copenhagen at the launch of the Cosmic Dawn Center, uh, my lecture focused on rotation as a principal informing agent of the universe. I also considered the notion of a series of vanishing points which correlate with the focus of attention or of consciousness and serves as an organizing principle for everything around it. In this lecture, I once again take a more terrestrial view, um, a terrestrial view of your discipline, and uh, I look at the relationship really between body and thought, experience and knowledge, particularly in relation to different conceptions of time, all within our place in, uh, I suppose, the explorative history and the relationship between bodily consciousness optical consciousness, and our perception of time. I think optical consciousness is one which is particularly pertinent uh, to you, but um, I have very often said that uh, in my lectures that you as astronomers are disembodied eyes. And it's one of the things I, I want to develop. So. Um, Jean Leadoff, an American anthropologist, works, worked amongst the Yakana in Venezuela in the early 1970s, which gave rise to her book, The Continuum Concept, in which she compares and contrasts child-rearing practices amongst the Yakana and those she was familiar with in the United States. She came to understand that an intimate form of rearing, which included constant physical contact, through the infants being car carried by adults in their daily tasks, sleeping with their parents, and having their needs attended to immediately and without fuss, gives rise to a strong personal security for infants, which in turn leads to optimal physical and emotional development and adaptability. Yakana children sense and fulfill their elders' expectations of being innately social and cooperative, and develop a strong understanding of the need for self-preservation. The children's knowledge of the world is literally embodied through the very immediate experiences and practices from which they derive a very healthy drive for personal and independent exploration. Time is immediate, and it is within the flow of the daily and the seasonal cycles. In exploring the world, the creation of lines of longitude came as a result of voyagers uh, needing to locate themselves in an east-west axis at sea. Such information was required on voyages of discovery and subsequently on voyages whose chief purpose was trade. In order to know one's longitude at sea, one needs to know what local time is aboard the ship, and also the time at home port, or another place of known longitude, at the very same moment. So they need to be understood simultaneously. For this, accurate timekeeping was essential and gave rise to a massive international competition known as the Longitude Prize, 
which was grudgingly bestowed on a British watchmaker and carpenter, John Harrison, in the 1760s and uh, 1770s for his maritime chronometer. The two, clocks, the two clock times enable the navigator to convert the hour difference into degrees of geographical separation, since the Earth takes 24 hours to revolve 360 degrees. The navigator is required to hold in mind two separate places, pla uh, two separate place-related times in order to make the distance calculation. The one time zone is referential, literally mind, and the other is immediate, that related to the body. I found this on the web from Hello. <laughs> One of the conundrums that had to be resolved as a result of the development of longitude was the necessity of establishing an arbitrary line which separated one day from another. The irregular international date line zigzags its way between continental Russia and North America and then cuts idiosyncratically and for human convenience through the largely uninhabited spaces of the Pacific. In the remote Pacific, the double-hulled canoes in the lower image were recorded as they were going out to welcome James, James Cook on his third voyage. These high-status dugouts were able to accommodate several dozen crew and were used as uh, status markers and in ceremonies, but they were also capable of great long-distance voyages across the Pacific. In relatively slow-moving craft, the experience of time is seamless and predictable. The length of day or night does not seemingly change significantly. But leaping forward two centuries, our experience of both speed and time have been radically transformed. Traveling at Mark II, the Concorde with its trademark sonic boom halved the time of previous transatlantic flights with the result that one could literally arrive in New York at the same time as you'd left London. Time is no longer experiential here, but conceptual. This map of Brandon Rieschel's shows the world's time zones without reference to land masses. It highlights the artificiality of these boundaries. Time zones are intended to solve the problem of different solar times around the world, where solar time refers to the time it feels like, based on the position of the sun in the sky. In looking at the series of vertical lines that relate to longitude, one recognizes that the irregularity of the international date line is not so odd after all. The initial idea for a worldwide time zone system gained currency at an international meridian conference in October 1884 in Washington, D.C., partly in response to the need for uni the unification of local times uh, of departures and arrivals f due to the revolutionary speed of travel due to the new railroads that spanned the continental expanse of the United States. One just needs to point out um, that the international date line is actually on either side of this map. And uh, the only places that one can recognize are um, the tip of South America and India. Otherwise, I mean, they are basically very, very abstract. <laughs> As uh, Yuri Gargaran, the Russian astronaut, orbited the Earth for the very first time in April 1961, and John Glenn, the American, uh, the same in Friendship 7 in the following year, human beings were able to view the complete globe of the Earth for the first time. Here you can notice the Red Sea, you can see the Arabian Peninsula, and you can see India. Glenn viewed the Earth from about 160 kilometers uh, above its surface as he orbited it in just four hours, 56 minutes, 
While Cook's first circumnavigation of the Earth took from August 1768 to July 1771, uh, a period just short of three years. Since the time of the Greeks, uh, it had been surmised that the Earth was spherical and proofs had been set up to confirm the hypothesis. But here finally was ocular proof of the fact that it was uh, a sphere. However, proponents of the Flat Earth Society still remain numerous enough to organize annual conferences where they confirm each, uh, they confirm each other in their dogmatic views. While science is susceptible to the inclusion of new knowledge and committed to accounting for anomalies, unfortunately, dogma is resolutely fixed in its beliefs. This is a 2007 uh, work of mine called Stellar Noise, uh, made of salt and 540 million year old black carboniferous dust. And it represents distant galactic positions in the two square degree field, pinpointed by X-ray, infrared, and radio telescope data. The relative size of the dots is not necessarily indicative of the distance since the galaxies themselves differ radically in size. If one considers the definite outline of the Red Sea and the Arabian Peninsula on the photograph of the Earth on the previous slide, and then looks at these rudimentary place markers, we begin to understand the tenuous nature of our grasp of these extremely distant phenomena. We have come to know they are there through the faintest emanations, way beyond the optical. You all know this April 10 image of the black hole M87, located about 55 million light years from Earth. Fuzzy as it is, it provides us with answers to questions that have been variously approached using different kinds of data. As you know, M87, the first black hole whose mass is, has been variously calculated by three precise methods, me measuring the motion of the stars, the swirl of surrounding gases, and now thanks to the Event Horizon Telescope Imaging Project, the diameter of the black hole shadow. The EHT picture, showing a glowing orange ring of gases and dust around the black hole, has helped us to see whether one or, uh, one or the other of these mass measuring methods is correct. As far as I can understand, According to Einstein's general theory of relativity, the diameter of the dark space in the center of the image, the black hole shadow, is directly related to its mass. The shadow of uh, M87's black hole yielded a diameter of 38 billion kilometers, which astronomers, uh, uh, which astronomers calculate a mass of 6.5 billion suns, very close to the mass suggested by the motion of stars. For the uninitiated, the soft focus image looks a bit like a low light photograph of a donut seen directly from above uh, with its characteristic hole in the center. But in this rendering of, of a black hole, the details of the black hole phenomena are presented in high definition features not available from the EHT picture, but represent our best understanding of elements of the black hole phenomena as we understand it from such a great distance and given the limited data that we have. Far from looking like a hole, the central position, the, the central portion is represented as part of a sphere with the photon sphere rotating around its equator the photons escaping at the event horizon provide us with some sense of the diameter of the hole. The composite EHT image provides us with an estimated diameter of a staggering 38 billion kilometers. That an indistinct image, such as the one of M87, can be interpreted in units of measurement of human devising over such indescribably large distances uh, is, is the miraculous ability somehow to embody the disembodied, to create a mental abstraction from the optical one, derived from infrared, radio, and X-ray information. 
from my limited point of view, I understand from these two images that the black hole is not circular, but spherical. And what more, uh, it has an axis. In earthly holes, something falling into it would drop down to the bottom of a cylindrical space, but not so in a black hole, where the object falls into the epicenter of the spherical field from any point on its event horizon. However, some photon paths are seemingly bent by the strong gravitational field caused by the black hole, creating a bright ring, the photon sphere, extending beyond the black hole's equator. For you, as uh, astronomers, the eight telescopes that participated in the Event Horizon collaboration is taken for granted. For those outside the field, the, the, EHT, the EHT observations that use the technique of the very long uh, baseline interferometry, uh, synchronizing these telescope facilities around the world, uh, exploiting the rotation of our planet to form one huge Earth-sized telescope observing at a wavelength of 1.3 millimeters is absolutely extraordinary. I mean, the, the capacity for, uh, for a community to come together to create a lens of that scale uh, as an outsider, and I think for the public, is really extraordinary. In 1716, uh, Edmund Haley, an English astronomer, had proposed a method of calculating our distance from the sun. The astronomical unit using the transit of Venus. In 1769, as part of a secret British mission, Cook observed the four phases of the transit of Venus from distant Tahiti. Two other independent observations were also made by Green and Salander with their own telescopes. So in contrast to the 2019 um, consortium um, of this worldwide telescope, uh, focusing its uh, uh, octoscopic views uh, on M87, uh, we, we have this extraordinary international collaboration, uh, a reflection of a common intent that sets its sights way beyond the sun or even our local solar system, but into the distant reaches of our galaxy. You, you all know the telescopes uh, that were used, some which we have used for Cosmos, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, Heinrich Hertz Submillimeter Telescope, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope, the South Pole Telescope, Atacama Pathfinder Experiment, IRM 30 Meter Telescope, Large Millimeter Telescope, and the Submillimeter Array. Most of us have experienced the after effects of a 12 or 15 hour flight west to east. It even has a name, uh, jet lag. The effects of both speed and changes in time affect our circadian rhythms. We are awake when we ought to be asleep and asleep when we ought to be awake. A flight, say, between New York and Sing Singapore covers a minuscule distance if one co considers it in relation to going, on, uh, a, uh, going to the moon or uh, journeys to Mars, which are already being contemplated. Such a journey would take between six and eight Earth months. The possibility of traveling beyond our solar system or galaxy at present is beyond conception, both in terms of bodily constraints and human longevity. However, in studying the two square degree field, our minds are able to project themselves across distances, viewing successive galaxies as we attempt to grasp the structure of our universe. The data gleaned enables us to understand unfathomable distances far beyond where our bodies could possibly go. In studies such as these and, as, and such as making sense of a black hole, the mind goes far beyond the constraints of embodiment. The mind goes far beyond where the body can follow. 
the possibility of traversing galactic distances was considered by none other than Einstein and his assistant, Nathan Rosen, in, 1930, in a 1935 paper. They envisaged spatial shortcuts that might someday make interstellar travel possible. Such hypothetical connections between two otherwise separate parts of the sheets of our universe we now know as wormholes. For those of us who have experienced the cramped discomfort of long distance flights uh, in economy class in particular, um, will appreciate its relative luxury when we consider that three men were confined for eight days in, Apollo, in this Apollo 11 capsule as they traveled to the moon and back. The exterior of the capsule shows the effect of the extreme heat generated by the friction of re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. In this tiny space, the three men not only had to be protected from the extremes of speed and heat uh, and cold, but also to have an interior atmosphere that was conducive to life. In July 1969, astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin landed the Apollo lunar module on the moon, while Michael Collins remained in lunar orbit in the command module. This remains an extraordinary moment in human endeavor and was encapsulated in Armstrong's famous words, one step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Few of us know or remember that five subsequent uh, missions, Apollo missions, also landed astronauts on the moon. So in these six space flights, 12 men in all worked, walked on the moon, a seemingly inconceivable act in the evolution of our species. The effect on the bodies of these men who undertook these long space flights included cardiovascular issues, gastroenteritis, urinary, uh, uh, urinary, tract, um, um, uh, uh, urinary tract issues, upper respiratory tract infections, psychological stresses, anxiety and depression also manifested during and after their, uh, their time in space. First published in 1949, Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces explores his theory of the mythological structure of the journey of the archetypal hero found in world myths. Time magazine placed his book in its list of the 100 best and most influential books written in English since it was founded in 1923. The astronauts' journeys to the moon, in a sense, take the form of a mythical quest as they move out of the familiar and have experiences that few or none of us ever will be likely to have. Their return from the fantastic to the familiar back home creates a narrative that is inspirational and aspirational for those in the society from which they come. In a similar way, your work as astronomers brings the distance closer and makes the seemingly incomprehensible accessible to the ordinary person. Undertaking mental quests, your discipline has brought the boon of your own knowledge to all. It's extremely important. You know, I think you take it for granted because of the detail that you work with. But it is uh, an extraordinary endeavor. Filmmaker George Lucas acknowledged Campbell's influence in the making of the Star Wars films. The films deal with many of the tasks, challenges, and archetypal figures associated with the hero's quest. Lucas takes such journeys beyond the terrestrial and places them in a galactic context, which brings with it unique challenges. The film represents elements that need to be managed in futuristic space travel. The films have captured the imaginations of generations of viewers with its spectacular science fictional technologies, extreme distances traveled in fantastic spacecraft, time warps, and visiting other planets. The ability of Lucas and his special effect co-workers have created an alternate reality, one which 
might well in time might well in time uh, become reality. Having visited NASA's Goddard Flight Center, where we saw the James Webb Telescope being constructed of beryllium and gold, we are only too aware of the complex problem-solving and technological innovation required in the design and production of spacecraft that must travel to these immense distances. In these renderings of spacecraft design from the Lucas films, we see human ingenuity projected within the field of science fiction. Imagined designs such as these have strange family resemblances to the form that the James Webb has sub subsequently ta taken. The shift of ideas and images from an imaginary world into physical manifestation happens first of all within the infinite confines of the human cranium. Something like the James Webb Telescope is thought, many people's thought made manifest. We take gravity so for granted as a form of organizing principle in our environment. We know if we drop a spoon that we have to look down on the floor to find it. It has somehow not fallen upwards towards the ceiling. We stand up straight and we are aware of the relative fixedness of the world around us. It is, a, it is an embodied relative uh, fixedness of the world around us. It is an embodied awareness of our context. However, however in this brief snippet of the 2013 film, Gravity, a science fiction thriller by Alfonso Cuaron, the character played by Sandra Bullock, one of the two American astronauts stranded in space after an accident, knows neither top nor bottom, nor back from front as she tumbles in undifferentiated darkness. The film graphically portrays the stress on the human body once it is out of the gravitational field. The film captures the impossibility of survival if one is marooned in space in a non-world. For Bullock's character, there are no gravitational or other coordinates that she can use to make sense of where she is. In films like Gravity or First Man, viewers are able to experience vicariously the stresses of what it might mean to travel within our solar system. It remains inconceivable in real terms what intergalactic travel might be. Um, at this point, it is only the mind that can project itself into these enormous depths. Uh, it is, um, in a way, I think travel uh, is... Uh, travel for us into deep space is most probably as inconceivable uh, as uh, travel on the Concorde would have been for, uh, for Cook uh, or for his Hawaiian hosts in their Great War canoes. Bullock, uh, as, uh, as the astronaut, falls into undifferentiated darkness unknowing without a gravitational field. However, this undifferentiated darkness, as we know it, it, it does actually have structure. The, the work of the mathematician and theoretical physicist, um, Henry Poincaré, created a new form of mathematics called the quantitative theory of differential equations and showed how it was possible to derive the most important information about the behavior of a family of solutions without actually having to solve the equation, since this may not always be possible. An approach he used to solve problems in celestial mechanics and mathematical physics, as he realized that this mathematics could be used to model the behavior of multiple bodies in free motion within the solar system. In his research on the three-body problem, Poincaré became the first person to discover a chaotic, deterministic system which laid the foundations of modern chaos theory. Poincaré identified the fact 
that there may come a point at which a function takes on an infinite value, especially in space-time, when matter is infinitely dense, such as the se at the center of a black hole. These points he called singularities. In photographing M87, the Event Horizon Telescope used multiple sightings with a common pointing to create the image of the black hole. The black hole formed the focal point of these sightings. The convergence of these foci resulting from triangulating and timing of the view of M87 places it at a common optical vanishing point. However, the black hole itself is a vanishing point of another sort entirely. Its gravitational field draws in photons and compresses them into an ever-diminishing space. This notion that the matter in a black hole diminishes even as it draws material into itself is, in com is completely counterintuitive to our earthly notion that if one puts things into a hole, it will certainly fill up. On the other hand, orthogonals in perspectival renderings converge to an optical vanishing point, structuring space from a single viewpoint using an imposed convention. The vanishing point in both these images are precisely delineated and constructed. The converging lines do, however, refer to a fixed point in continuous space. As the car travels, the vanishing point for the driver will consist consistently move ahead of it. One is never able to actually stand on the vanishing point, a contrast to the black hole into which, into which things literally vanish, while the vanishing point is const constantly elusive. Ilya Prigogin, the winner of the 1977 Nobel Prize for Chemistry, together with Isabella Stengers, in their 1996 book, The End of Certainty, proposed a new model that places humanity in direct communication with nature and not in opposition to it. They challenged the Newtonian paradigm of a mechanistic world where chance plays no part. While the Newtonian model emphasizes order, stability, equilibrium, their new paradigm embraces disorder, instability, disequilibrium, and temporality, or a heightened sensitivity to the flow of time. The world is seen as spontaneous and self-organizing, allowing for a unification of biology and physics. They related their theories strongly to psychology, consciousness research, and social transformation. Far from reducing science to timeless laws, Prigogin and Stengers regard time as an intrinsic factor in the flow of change and of evolution. We as humans have always been fascinated by the idea that life, life similar to our own might exist elsewhere. The search for planets that orbit in a star's habitable zone where it could possibly where it could be possible for liquid water to exist on the surface has relatively recently intensified. Planets of this sort we know as uh, exoplanets. We remember the first scientific detection uh, of planets of this sort, uh, the exoplanets recorded in 1988 and confirmed in 2012. As of April this year, 4,023 planets have been confirmed in 3,005 stellar systems. About one in five sun-like stars are thought to have Earth-sized planets in habitable zones. Assuming there are 200 billion stars in the Milky Way, we can hypothesize that there are 11 billion potentially habitable Earth-sized planets in our galaxy alone. This search for exoplanets is anthropocentric and is our obsession with contexts enough like our own to support life as we might recognize it. We seem intent on trying to find ourselves somewhere out there.
Returning once more to Cook, whose voyages were scientific expeditions equipped for systematic observation and inquiry. During the Enlightenment, science was understood as enlarging the bounds between mind and matter, reason and nature. It put reason in charge of reality and made this rule seem natural and right. The man of reason was objective, detached, dispassionate, free from emotion and weakness. And Cook, the great discoverer, was the epitome of such men, who, as he put it, that ambition leads me farther than any man has been before me, bringing the edges of the unknown into the light of rational understanding. The image shows Cook's arrival at Kealakukua Bay on the big island of Hawaii. On the far right, you can see a stone wall, which is the temple where he was, uh, where he was first welcomed as a, ki as a, as a god. And uh, the ancestral burial grounds are on that cliff face, which is known the, as the Way of the Gods. During his third voyage, Cook's extensive exploration of the world comes to an untimely end. On February 14, 1779, here at Kalakakua Bay, in attempting to reclaim a rowing boat needed uh, for coming ashore, a skirmish ensued in which Cook was clubbed to death and um, the chaos ensued with uh, sailors firing. For the last decade of his life, James Cook had spent much of his time in Polynesia, where the cosmos and the self were understood quite differently from the objective, dispassionate thinking that informed Cook's enlightenment thinking. Here in the Pacific, mind and heart were not split, nor mind and matter. They had a generative relation, and from them came the world of darkness, or Po, and then the wind of life, generating forms of the phenomenal world, the world of light, through eons of genealogical uh, exchanges. Within the Hawaiian belief system, to name something was also to claim it. Perhaps this is not too dissimilar to the Western practice of scientifically naming and laying claim to plants, insects, animals, stars, and galaxies. Nowadays, in the high altitudes on the rim of the extinct volcano Mauna Kea, way high up uh, beyond Kealakekua Bay, the contemporary telescopes scan dis the distances and places unimaginable to Cook. This is a 2011 drawing of mine called Cook's Death and the Way of the Gods, Kealakekua Bay. The imperial white obelisk marks the site where Cook was felled, its pristine form strangely out of place in this island context. Below the way of the gods, the memorial marks a fateful error in understanding and a tumultuous clash in beliefs. Way below our telescopes on Mauna Kea, the remoteness of this memorial placed on the edge of this undisturb undisturbed archaeological site has struck me powerfully as being very poignant on return visits. Death is the final disembodiment, the loss of the embodied presence, and the grief related to that is highly ritualized in many societies. Is it the point where life force vanishes, or is, it, is consciousness compressed? in a withdrawal to some central point as if in a black hole? If so, where does it go? These are the questions around the unknown and the mysterious, be that our attempt to understand the astronomical phenomena of the black hole or the loss of our bodily instrument and the cessation of the optical mental perception. Yet the firing of the synapses within the brain continue for some time after death as seen in this image. The, these are firings of the brain uh, still 10 minutes after death. Um, we, we see how these complex neural paths on a molecular level still retain, for some little while at least, the residue of the energetic tracery of the extremities of the projected mind.
This is a, a drawing I did many years ago of the two square degree field. And this is the shared focus of all of us here uh, in this room and over many years. Our minds converge on the seemingly small but infinitely deep field as we attempt to understand how space has been created and populated. The study of the phenomena of galaxy formation, dark matter, dark energy, stellar and galactic densities are the merest touchstones of the nature and the structure of our universe. The examination of the external complexity compels the creation of a similar internal complexity. So far as we have to reach out, so far do we have to reach in. The extremities to which the mind can travel in order to understand manifest phenomena is the exclusive prerogative of the, re the relationship between I and mind. The deep desire for other senses to experience the world beyond drives the development of technologies that enable us to travel in space, be it by the creative ingenuity initially promulgated in, the science, in science fiction and space technology, leading in time to its realization. Considering Cook's voyages, the Concorde, Apollo 11, and the James Webb, quantum leaps are possible. Yet the body lags behind the mind, leading to the tension between the embodied and the disembodied at the very center of our practice. Thank you. <laughs>